Judy, it is so great to have you here. You are in Jakarta. You're working hard on uh, your PhD. You're doing some incredible research. There's so much buzz about it. But first, I want to ask you a very important question. What's a nice lawyer accountant like you doing in dive tourism? What is going on? Well, uh, hi, Laurie. And uh, look, I think that... Um, like lots of people who really love marine conservation, I'm just one of those people who grew up going to the beach and grew up with a father who was a diver. Dad did a little bit of commercial diving at one point with Navy when he was younger. And my parents always had us down the beach. So it just leads you to, to you know, loving the marine environment. And um, as you go through your life as a scuba diver, as we all know, you see more and you want to know more. And you get to a point where you want to start saving the things that you've seen. So if I've been diving for you know, 35 years or more, and, and I notice now that a lot of the things that I used to see in the ocean when I was really young, you just don't see now. Those really big schools of pelagic fish, the absolute abundance of sharks and manta rays and, 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 and other forms of marine life is just not there. So you just have to start worrying about that for our children and for um, the people who live around the, 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 um, the equator effectively in all those less developed countries where most of our coral reefs lie. So I left my, I certainly lived my professional life as, a, as an accountant in the private sector and actually worked with Australia's largest fishing company, helping them on exploratory fishing in, uh, in different um, um, less developed country waters. And uh, then I moved into government as a lawyer. So I've, I've done a lot of work with government and international, on, on international affairs as well, um, looking at uh, fisheries conservation and also fisheries management. So the back background that I have um, is really quite a good one for, for taking an overview of what's happening with the dive industry and how the dive industry can actually relate to marine conservation and what, what we can be doing in that space. So funny thing is that it all everything comes together. It's kind of perfect. Well, okay, tell us tell us the title of your PhD or the, your the working title of your PhD. Sure. So my, my PhD research is on um, dive tourism and its impact, well the formal title is Dive Tourism and its Impact on Integrated Coastal Management and Livelihoods for Artisanal Fishers, but you know it's, it's, it's rough enough to say you know it's Dive Tourism and its Impact on Marine Conservation and Livelihoods for Local Fishers. Okay, so this is a lot for people to get their minds around. So let's go through this step by step because um, when I first spoke to you a few months ago, I, I was just, I hadn't made the connection and you started to really help me make a major, some major connections about why you're doing this. Um, so let's start with um, marine uh, coral reefs. You're working primarily with coral reefs. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. I'm working, actually, my research is only in less developed countries. And I think the, the reason for that is that 75% of the world's most productive and beautiful coral reefs are actually located in around about 101 uh, less developed countries and territories in the tropics in a broad swathe roughly around the equator. Now, the same 101 countries and territories are actually home to most of the world's poorest people. And um, at least 275 million of those people depend directly on coral reefs and fish and marine resources for food security and for income. Now dive tourism as it happens is concentrated in the same countries in exactly the same locations as those coral reefs and tropics and you know that's no surprise because naturally divers want to see these really beautiful coral reefs and the fish and the sharks and the manta rays and all of the marine life that, that exists on those incredibly biodiverse uh, coral reef systems. So, I mean, another thing that we know, a lot of us have been in the dive industry for a long time, is we've seen this massive migration of dive tourism from what I tend to call the temperate water countries of, say, the United States, Europe, the UK, um, and Australia into those tropical countries around the equator. So, I mean, everyone is sort of headed in that direction. And that's where all the marine biodiversity, well, well, a, a great percentage of the marine biodiversity is anyway. So this coincidence of geography means that most of the coral reefs, many of the world's poorest people, and dive tourism are all located in the same less developed countries. There, there, so there's conflict. Is that what you're telling me? Is that the... Is, is there conflict with everything coming together in this space? 
I think I think um, there there certainly is in some areas, but not in all areas. But I think the, the most important thing to draw from the fact that these you know these these three things come together is that there's competition for resources. Perhaps you know. Um, Again, you know, if, if, if I've been diving 30, 35 years, then there wasn't the population in the, in 35 years ago that there is now, and there there weren't the threats to the anthropogenic threats to coral reefs that we have now. And we know, you know, you've done a lot of work with other um, speakers, so we know roughly what all of those anthropogenic threats are. And uh, and we also didn't have the volume of dive tourists. So I think what you'd say is there's competition for resources, and we, and we have to sort of look at at how we play that out. For the benefit of all concerned, because we want divers to see great coral reefs, we want the coral reefs saved for their own benefit and for the benefit of those who, who live on them to preserve that biodiversity and to make sure that um, food security is, is available to, to those who, who most need it. Well, um, in many of these dive destinations, we have marine protected areas. Are they not... Um uh, a big part of the the puzzle to protect uh, the and c conserve um, a marine biodiversity. Yes, I think everyone everyone acknowledges that marine protected areas are, are really one of the most important tools in conserving coral reefs and marine resources. But one thing that we do know is that in less developed countries, they often face great difficulties in funding uh, protection for coral reefs and, and marine resources, in, in even within MPAs. A lot of those, um, there can be a lot more pressing issues for less developed countries to deal with. While there are more than 700 marine protected areas, Areas worldwide that incorporate coral reefs. Many of them are known as paper parks. Now, what that means is that you know they're there on the map and they're there in paper. The structures, the management structures, are set up for them. But in reality, there's there's no capacity to enforce the rules of the MPA and to manage them properly to protect the resources within them. So many of the um, the MPAs in the tropics are largely unprotected, and they're they're exposed to um, to lots of forces. And one of those forces uh, is destructive fishing and overfishing. So we know that what that tends to look like is is when we see um, we see shark finning, we see uh, whale sharks as well killed for their fins. We see manta rays killed these days for gill rakers that go into the Chinese uh, medicine trade in. Uh, Hong Kong and other parts of Asia, and to to the Chinese market around the world, we see the killing of turtles for food and for income. Uh, we see dynamite fishing, cyanide fishing, spear fishing in some parts of the world. We see the use of small gauge nets and um, you know the, the wiping out of fish populations in some areas areas for the aquarium trade and the live reef fish trade, which again feeds up into Asia. Now, all of these activities actually destroy coral reefs and fish habitats indeed, and um, the megafauna species, which dive tourism is actually based on. So what, what we know is that marine protected areas struggle at times, not always, but at times, to offer the right level of protection. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, I, I want I want hope. I want hope. So so what do we do? We're, we're, what what do we do if marine protected areas aren't aren't able to do the whole job? Um, what what's the plan? How do how do we protect these coral reefs? Well, I think the reason that we're sort of talking to me today is because, you know, my research is looking at what dive tourism can actually do to, to help um, marine protected areas, but also, um, you know, those areas of coral reef and marine, uh, marine megafauna that's actually outside of marine protected areas. So we've established that dive tourism occurs in the, in the world's most beautiful coral reefs and that many coral reefs are in remote locations where there are very few sources of food and income for the local people. So dive tourism Tourism is actually often cited by marine protected area managers and so some of the big um, international development agencies as having a capacity to conserve coral reefs and to diversify the livelihoods of local fishers away from their heavy dependence on coral reefs, fish and marine resources. Because in part, because dive tourism is actually co-located in those really remote areas and some of those really remote uh, coastal and reef areas have very few or no other sources of income. 
So what, one thing we know too is that divers are willing to pay more to see healthy coral reefs and um, pelagic fish stocks and, uh, you know, like everyone loves to see a big school of trevally or a big school of barracuda, for example, and to see the marine megafauna species that we love, including whale sharks, sharks, manta rays, whales and turtles. So I think we can agree that it's in the best interests of dive tourism operators and dive divers themselves that coral reefs and megafauna are actually protected. In reality, it just makes good business sense for dive tourism and, uh, to look after these coral reefs and these species that we want to focus on. So the, the, the uh, development community is saying that dive tourism, dive businesses are part of the solution for marine conservation because they're providing alternate sources of, of livelihoods rather than bombing, fish bombing and, and, and finning and, and live fish trade. Um, we, can, we can bring in dive tourism to help people make, make a living. Well, a lot of um, uh, marine protected area managers, so professional marine protected area managers and, and some development agencies have, have said at times that dive tourism has a massive role to play in, um, in, in, in helping to manage marine protected areas and to provide, you know, livelihoods for these coral reef areas. So, yes, there, but, but no one has ever done any research on what dive tourism's role actually is and if it can achieve these objectives. So that's why I've said about doing the research that I'm doing. Now, the, if um, in terms of um, um, marine protected areas in less developed countries, the best model we know for protecting coastal areas, which happen to include not just coral reefs but mangroves and coastal zones and um, really do tend to include the people who live along those shorelines, so the best model is a thing called Sustainable Integrated Coastal Management, which was developed in 2005 by Alan White and Patrick Christie and, and others. Now, to do that, um, Alan White and Patrick Christie and others actually looked at a group of um, very, very well-funded marine protected area projects in Indonesia and the Philippines. And what they established in terms of the, the lessons learned from those projects was that there are nine factors that are necessary to cr create what we call sustainable integrated coastal management. So after speaking with, um, with um, Dr. Alan White, I've added a tenth factor to their model, which is actually recognition of traditional marine tenure. But I'll talk to you in a, little, in a moment about um, what those you know, now ten factors are and what they, what they actually mean to dive tourism. So, um, but yeah, so that's, that's the sort of starting point for, for my research is to measure what dive tourism is doing and can do against White's model for what you need for sustainable ICM. Wow, this is really amazing. This is, this is uh, I think at first blush, um, people's eyes may glaze over, um, <laughs> but um, yeah. once, once, uh, since I've had a chance to uh, hang out with you at Beneath the Sea and we've done a few Skype calls, I'm, I'm, I'm really starting to get how important uh, we are, our businesses are, in, in protecting these very fragile and, and beautiful areas and what you are doing is so important to our businesses and to the health of coral reefs and to healthy oceans. I can't even I can't even begin to to go on about you. So oh. I'm not. And we're going to keep going. So right now you uh, have added this tenth component, and that is the importance of marine tenure and the importance of the livelihoods of local fishers. So what? does dive tourism have to do with local fishers? Well, let me take you back a step first. So what I've been telling you, told you that there are, you know, there's this, this model by, by White and Christie and others um, called Sustainable ICM or Integrated Coastal Management. And, and let me, I'm going to walk you through that a little bit first before we move on to the livelihoods and the tenure issues. But um, I guess what I want to say to you is this model, which, which as I say is very well accepted in marine conservation and science circles as being the best possible model to get the best result for, 
for sustainable coastal areas. Um, the cool thing is that dive tourism actually is a private sector participant within this model and that dive tourism can actually impact all 10 factors within the model. So that this is a really kind of um, holistic view at what dive tourism can actually do and what its place is. I think you'll, you'll be very well aware of a number of other um, um, uh, models that are around the place uh, very important sort of um, model set up to look at what dive tourism, what sustainable dive tourism should look like. But in reality, most of those models only look at one or two or maybe even three elements of White's framework, whereas best practice dive tourism is actually going to look at all ten. So I think it might be a good time for me to just talk to you a little bit about what those ten factors are. What do you think? In rough terms, okay then? So... The first, the first, um, just find the right spot and make sure I'm telling you the right thing. Okay, the first element of White's model is a thing called uh, linking management to improve biophysical conditions. Now, what this means is that you, this is this is basically where most of the current models for sustainable dive tourism sit. So they look at the really important factors of what dive tourism is actually doing to physically impact the reef. So that could be things like preventing anchor damage. To, um, to coral reefs. It could be creating uh, no-take zones to protect fish life. It could be building sustainably to make sure that sewerage isn't running off into the water that we want to dive in and the water that cover covers the reef. It would be things like preventing uh, the dumping of garbage, and, um, and and also something as interesting as collaborating in scientific research, which can have uh, an, an, an effect of improving the condition of coral reefs and fish stocks in um, no, in no take zones. White's second factor is stakeholder particip participation in decision making. So what this really means is involving the local people in identifying the status of um, you know, coral reefs and fish stocks and then figuring out what's important in terms of protecting those for so, you know, say for creating no take zones or marine protected areas. But the local people are there and they know these areas very well. They're effectively their homes. So it doesn't make sense to leave them out of these sort of, um, this sort of analysis and this sort of decision making. The third element in White's framework is um, is uh, contribution to economic returns and, and income generation. So what that means is economic returns are things that activities that bring income into the management of coral reefs. For example, in lots of places where we go, people pay dive user fees, and we're all quite happy to do that because we we know that um, those dive user fees tend to go into um, conservation, and sometimes they go to uh, livelihoods for local people. Um, the other thing that uh, people can do in terms of livelihoods, and we will talk a little bit more about livelihoods later, is to employ um, local people and to train them and to make sure that they have a high number of local staff. But as I say, we'll talk more about livelihoods later. The fourth element of White's framework is making sure that there's a an, an adequate legal policy legal policy framework in place. Now, this is a matter for, for governments, of course, in terms of making sure that there's um, supportive um, legislation in place to protect marine biodiversity, but also it's something where dive operators can be involved, and many are around the world, in terms of helping to um, promote legislation and sometimes draft legislation that will actually help to protect the marine environment. Dive operators also have a really important role in, in influencing policy makers and decision makers. The fifth element is making sure that there is a capacity for law enforcement. So we all know that whether it's just a marine protected area or whether it's a no-take zone, we need to be able to, uh, to enforce the rules of those areas. Now, for a dive tourism oper operator, that might mean coordinating with the local authorities and making sure that um, you work with local authorities in, in uh, detecting and apprehending violations. But it also might mean, as it does for, for many dive operators around the world, building capacity by doing things like using the dive centre's boats for patrols. It might be loaning or giving fuel to, uh, to local authorities that don't have enough fuel to do their patrols, or things like training staff or loaning patrols for, for, for um, sorry, loaning radios or making radios available for communication. 
The sixth element of Wyatt's framework is building durable institution, institutions. For, 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 it's actually building durable institutions beyond leadership change, which sounds like a lot, but what that really means is building strong relationships with governments and politicians who either are in power now or who may be in power later. What that means is really, you know, in lots of countries, and it's not just less developed countries, you have, you know, some sort of fairly stable arrangements going on, but then when governments change, those sort of rules can change and that sort of support can change. So by building s stable relationships with, with people from both parties, you're aiming to make sure that you're, um, you've always got a stable platform to support the conservation efforts that you want to, that you want to be in place. The seventh element of White's framework is actually the role of the private sector and the, what role does the private sector actually have in um, protecting marine protected areas or conservation. So this is where dive tourism comes in because dive tourism is actually a private sector operator and it does have a role in many parts of the world in conserving um, marine resources in the absence of government. So where government doesn't have the money or perhaps the will or the resources to protect an area, dive tourism often steps in and uh, is able to do patrols and work with local people and, and, and achieve quite a bit in that space. Some dive tourism operators around the world actually manage small areas of MPAs informally. The eighth um, element of White's framework is supporting government functions. Now what this really means is building the capacity of local law enforcement officers to, to, to run the patrols that need to be run and building the capacity of locals to actually manage their own protected areas. A lot of, around the world there's, sort of a, there's quite a lot of work now going on on, on things called LMMAs, locally, locally managed marine areas. So what that means uh, it would be if, if dive operators and other private sector players actually help local people to local to manage their local marine managed LMMAs, local marine managed areas. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it yeah. happens in uh, yeah, no, uh, all this stuff. But there you go, it actually happens already in quite a few places around the world. The ninth element is education. So and this is the education of government officials in terms of the, the need for conservation and and in terms of the importance of the resources that they have there for biodiversity to feed their own people, but also for tourism, for example, so that we have income flows from tourism. Um, and also um, educating local people and educating scuba divers too about the importance of the marine environment and uh, conserving it, but also the importance of livelihoods for local fishing people. So the tenth element um, is the one that I've added, which is called recognition of traditional marine tenure. We'll, but we'll talk a little bit more about what that is shortly. Wow. wow. So it's a lot. It sounds like a lot. But, I, but what I was saying to you really is that it's a really holistic framework. If you, it, it, some dive operators now, many dive operators in fact, are doing all of those things. And effectively, that's exactly what's needed for 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 fairly s sort of serious level of marine conservation. Well, you can just see where uh, our our businesses just drop into each one of these these elements. There's no doubt that uh, the development community is right that we if we realized it, we have a huge role to play at so many different levels in in protecting the the uh, the marine environment that we that we work in. So now we're going to talk about the role of fishers in dive tourism. What, why should dive businesses be concerned about um, local fishers? Well, I think it's a really important issue, and I, and I know many dive tourism operators around the world who, who, who recognize this and who work very closely with local communities, local fishermen and local communities. And the reason for that is, remember in the beginning we said, you know, there's this coincidence that all the coral reefs and, uh, you know, some of the world's poorest people and all the dive tourism is located in the same place. And then we went on to say that because of time and population change and anthropogenic threats, that there is um, there's 
a you know a lot of um, user competition, if you like, for for those different resources. So I mean, really, you know, dive tourists. When you think about these extraordinary locations that a lot of us get to go to and a lot of us want to go to. You have to be a reasonably well-off person to go to those places, to have the money to fly there, to have a week's holiday at a dive resort that would cost you somewhere between three and five thousand dollars generally. I mean, really, it doesn't take much to sort of think that the people that who live there are, are living on absolutely very little. The only source of protein that they have is, in fact, generally fish. Some have pigs or other. Um, protein, but but there's very little out there. So for me, uh, to be honest, you know, it, after diving in the Solomon Islands, which was my first developed country diving, or develop, developing country diving back in, uh, ooh, what year was that? It was a few years ago now. Back in 1990 was the first time I went abroad to a, a less developed country to dive, and one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. And I remember thinking that it just, it didn't strike me as being fair, I suppose, that we would dive those reefs and not and acknowledge that those people in, in the Solomon Islands, certainly as in most of Micronesia, literally have traditional rights to ownership of those reefs. But anyway, so if we want to provide um, um, livelihoods to those people who, who live along those shorelines, there are a range of ways, different ways of doing that. Livelihood payments tend to come to local fishers from dive tourism in a number of forms. So to give you an example, there'll be payments for things like coastal leases where you might run a, a dive operation there'll be dive user fees which, which we've said occur all over the world for each diver that goes diving in a certain location you'll pay a certain amount, small amount of money generally and there often there are payments for not fishing so I know of many dive operators around the world who will separate out an area for a no-take zone, often sometimes part of a marine protected area, sometimes not, and they'll actually pay fishermen, local fishers, not to fish there. And what you tend to find happening is that um, that small no-take zone will actually form um, a breeding ground for fish and, uh, and given time there will be spillover of fish from that no-take zone and, and um, uh, if uh, it, all things being right, um, people will be able to catch more fish outside that no-take zone later. I have to say oh. that in some places, well certainly some of the places that I've been to, not necessarily the least developed countries but even more developed countries, there's a very, um, uh, um, the, the situation between local fishers and dive, dive operators is a very contentious um, situation. Uh, the dive operators want them to not fish at all. The, the locals are fishing and oftentimes they're providing the fish at the restaurants so that those dive tourists can go and have their fresh, fresh fish at the restaurant. So they're all playing at odds with each other. So what you're saying is that, that, that everybody needs to start talking and, and uh, come up with a framework where everybody wins. Well, look, I think that's right. And I think there's a couple of issues there. If I you know, go back to the beginning of what you just said, and that is that the, what happens is really different in developed countries and less developed countries. So, you know, my research is only in less developed countries, really, for, for those sort of reasons. So I'm, I can really only comment on that. But, um, um, yes, you're right. You know, sustainable, sustainable fishing is generally not going to be cleaning up the reef to, to feed dive tourists fish for lunch and crayfish. Um, you know, sustainable fishing for, for, for dive tourism is probably more likely to look like pelagic fish that are caught offshore, they're not caught on the coral reefs. And there is a whole bunch of people, scientists and practitioners, doing work in that space. I mean, there are some people who suggest that to be sustainable, dive resorts need to not serve fish at all. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, a conversation that's being had in different places. But that's not, that's not what part of I'm, what, what, part of what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is that, yes, there are, as you say, there are many people who are users of these coral reef systems, and we need to accommodate all of them, certainly. So another way that you can get livelihoods to local fishermen from, um, from dive tourism is payments for goods and services. Now, that could be things like transporting guests, buying fresh fish, fresh fruit and vegetables from, um, from local people, 
buying handicrafts, paying for cultural performances, and um, paying for local tours where the income from the local tours goes directly to those fishermen. Another really important area, and a lot of people do this in these less developed countries, is um, the training and employment of local people. So there's quite a lot of um, what I would call low-skilled employment of local people. So um, having people as tank fillers, perhaps as office staff, hospitality, hospitality staff, boat handlers and dive guides. But um, one thing we, I think we need to move into more is higher skill roles, so training people as dive professionals, so dive masters, assistant instructors and instructors, training people as dive managers, um, conservation managers and hospitality managers. And in many places, as we know, it's important to train people in, um, in, in language as well. The other, the other way that people traditionally receive incomes or livelihoods from dive tourism is from community benefit programs. Now, there are a range of community benefit programs run by dive tourism operators all over the world, and they tend to fall into an, a range of categories. Some of them would be for um, schools, for health or for garbage and recycling. So, for example, I can think of some dive operators who pay school teachers or who provide books or school supplies. They may, might pay kindergarten teachers or, you know, one uh, operator I'm thinking of now who provided a motorboat, uh, uh, sorry, uh, an, an engine, an outboard engine for, uh, for children to be able to go to school on, a, on an island a little bit further away. Health programs, people do tend to provide medications. They provide maternal health or infant health um, programs for local villages. And garbage recycling is becoming increasingly an issue and some dive operators are working with local people on recycling programs and uh, it's not just you know garbage collection but it's actually bringing income back to the locals from the recycling. So those are pretty cool initiatives but they're the sorts of things that we would see from uh, from um, dive tourism as becoming livelihoods for local people that would actually help them to move away from destructive fishing and overfishing. And, and then there's the whole issue of marine tenure and this is not found in the Caribbean um, as far as I know. I have never heard it in the Caribbean but it is certainly more of a Melanesian um, a cultural approach uh, to to manage managing natural resources and and that's a very big part of your your uh, research so can you first give us a definition of marine tenure and then tell us why this is this is so important well traditional marine tenure is really important and and I think though it's an interesting thing Laurie because as you say you know it's not well um, discussed or thought of in the Caribbean but I'll come back and there are areas of the world where it is, is more, more broad, broadly known. I'll come back to that in a moment. But in general terms, in terms of what traditional marine tenure is, traditional marine tenure tends to be where there are some rights that exist for local people to access coral reefs and marine resources below the high tide mark. Now, that doesn't have to be ownership. It could be the right to use and enjoy those um, coral reefs or those, those fish. It could be harvesting and collecting, or it could be commercial rights like the ability to sell, mortgage, or lease. And there are different forms of tenure all over the world. In fact, in a lot of parts of the world, people may not have um, tenure which is recognized at law, but they do traditionally have the right to, to live along those shorelines and use the resources literally out front of where they live. Now, what we tend to find is that traditional marine tenure, which broadly exist, existed around the world, tended to be extinguished by colonization. So when governments that, that, that came in that were um, perhaps from European um, homes or from the United Kingdom, then we had the common law and civil law installed, which doesn't give anybody rights below the high tide mark. It says that any resources within the ocean are common property. But the reality is that as, um, as uh, resources become more scarce and populations are growing, there's increasing level of conflict over traditional marine tenure, both in dive tourism and also in small-scale fisheries around the world. You see that in, uh, across Africa, across the Indian Ocean, 
um, uh, certainly in the Southeast Asian countries and none of and and the Caribbean. In fact, and none of these uh, areas, as you know, uh, are sort of known as having very strong traditional marine tenure rights, like those that exist in Melanesia, so Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands. But having said that, as I said a moment ago, just because they don't have those very strong rights that are, that exist in Melanesia, they do have some form of traditional marine tenure rights. And, um, and uh, you know, there's increasing conflict because those rights are often ignored by dive tourism operators and others. And so that's the thing. This is interesting to me because um, I'm thinking of, I used to live in the Cayman Islands. And so what we would uh, call um, locals having the right to fish certain, certain species or whatever, uh, we never called it marine tenure, but it is marine no. tenure. No, well, it is. You know, you know, that's just the whole deal. I suppose it's tricky whenever you come up with a phrase. Within the, um, the scientific literature on uh, marine protected area management and local marine um, LMMA, I keep forgetting what that stands for. But um, the point is that, um, you know, they call it customary marine tenure. Tra traditional marine tenure is more of a legal phrase, which is why I tend to use it. But it means the same thing. It means that the, the local people have some form of right. And it's also, it's also well and truly acknowledged that those those rights tend to have been extinguished by colonizing governments, but but it, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So you've got these sort of, you know, formally and informally. Formally, their rights may not exist in most countries, but informally, people still believe and live as though they do have those rights. So, and, and if someone's living along a shoreline and needs to feed their family and there's nothing else out there but fish, I mean, really, you've really got to consider quite carefully what what um, what rights they might have to those fish, which may or may not be stronger than the rights that a that a local dive operator would have. Well, let's do let's let's do a recap. So poverty and healthy reefs are directly linked, and mm -hmm. because dive tourism relies on healthy reefs, we need to deal with the poverty thing. Otherwise, we will not have healthy reefs and we will not have healthy businesses. So this is, this is the first step. The second step is if we're going to have um, a, a, a healthy reefs, we need to protect them. And uh, marine parks, marine protected areas are not enough. There has to be actually a broader framework. And you're call, you call it the Sustainable Integrated Coastal Management Framework. Um, yeah. And with the, with the nine steps plus your step, which is a 10th step, adding the, lo the importance of local fishers into this holistic framework where dive tourism actually slots mm -hmm. into each one of these, these, these parts of the framework. How am I doing so far? Really well. The one thing, the one thing that maybe I didn't mention. In fact, you know, ten ten points there. But one thing I didn't mention, I guess, um, properly, is that marine protected areas are a tool of integrated coastal management. So they're one of the tools that integrated coastal management uses to protect coral reefs and, and marine resources. And within that, so we, so you've got integrated coastal management is the big picture. Marine protected areas are a tool within that, and dive tourism operators are a private sector actor within that. So it's got this kind of neat little framework of boxes, if you like. So um, I, I love how it kind of works out together. Oh, it, and, and, and as, we, as, we, as we come back to this, this idea of the sustainable integrated coastal management framework, we're starting to bring back the whole notion of marine tenure, which was around the world a long time ago, but now it's, now it's paying lip service. There's only a few places where they actually um, it, it's actually illegal, right? But now we're discovering that having marine tenure is it's good for the local people, it's good for the reefs, and having, um, having, having the uh, below the watermark as the commons is destroying everything in the ocean. So we now have to give ownership back to the locals so that they can protect it. It's theirs, they will protect it. So we have local, oh gosh, L, local marine management areas so now they have a vested interest it's theirs they take care of it this is marine tenure this is all we're going back to a a uh, a, a management program that worked hundreds maybe probably thousands of years ago and this is all part of this integrated coastal management framework 
Well, I think, uh, look, I, I worry a little bit about some of what you just said. I think it would be a bit of a stretch to say that, that, the, that, the, that the commons is problematic and that, you know, the, you know the, any, any form of answer is just giving tenure back to, to local people and, um, and um, you know, stepping away from it. I don't think that's what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that recognition of traditional marine tenure where it exists is really important because what it tends to mean is that you then include local people as stakeholders in the decisions around what you protect and how you protect it and then perhaps in those some of those decisions around things like dive user fees and whether uh, local people have some sort of income. I mean, what we do know is, is what we've been saying over and over again is that local people depend on these coral reefs and marine resources for income and for food security. So if we want local people, you know, not to kill all the sharks and the manta rays to sell, for, to put food on the table or to be able to, you know, most of these countries, people have to pay to send their children to school. How are you sending a kid to school in Indonesia? Or if you live on the coast and you don't have any money, you, you know, there's no, there's no kind of office jobs or, or banks for people to go to. So it, it, it just seems to me that to, to be able to manage that need for food security and for income, then you have to look at this issue of traditional marine tenure. And uh, now, look, a lot of dive operators around the world already do this. And the way that they do it um, tends to mean that they are providing livelihoods for local people. They involve them as decision makers um, in um, the management of, of um, no-take zones. And, it, you know, it's not, it's not a new concept. It's one that's well and surely in play. And some of the really the most successful dive operators in the world are actually doing this. Tell me so, who they are. Tell me who these are. Uh, well, part of, certainly part of my research, one thing, that, one thing I just also want to talk to you about before we move on to that area is that a little bit of the a little bit more on the relationship between dive tourism and providing livelihoods and whether or not that has any impact on on reducing destructive fishing and overfishing we know that there are lots of um, economic valuation studies for coral reefs and sharks whale sharks and manta rays on the value of those resources to dive tourism which is really cool because you know the first step in uh, looking at not consuming resources is 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 finding um, non consumptive uses for them. So dive tourism, God bless it, is a non-consumptive use. I mean, ideally, people can come and look at these um, cool animals and great coral reefs and then um, pay for them and go away and the animal still lives. But in reality, um, so if we look at some of these studies, for example, and as I say, I think these studies are a great thing. If we look at, there's a study, for example, done in Palau by um, Gabriel Biana and others on reef sharks. So what they were able to say was to is that um, a, a, a reef shark, which is a white tip reef shark, is worth 108 US dollars alive. Oh, no, wait on, that's not it. Oh, 108 US dollars dead for its fins and its meat. So that's the calculation they came up with at the time. But the same shark. Um, if it stayed alive for the purposes of dive tourism, is worth about 1.8 million a year for each year of its life. Now that's a pretty big difference, don't you think? Now, one of the things, now this study, Gabriel Viana and others actually did include some uh, payments for salaries in dive tourism in their calculations, but in the main, a lot of these studies don't look at who gets that money? So it's fine to say that, say, a whale shark might be worth X dollars alive, but, you know, there's only this much dead. But in reality, if you're not thinking about where that money is going to, I don't know that you're changing anything. So if all that money is going to the dive tourism operator, an expatriate dive tourism operator, or a national who, um, you know, pretty much probably runs his business on, on exactly the same lines as an expatriate does, then and if none of that money is going to the fisherman who would have got, say, in Viana's case, the $108 for a dead shark, if he doesn't get $108 out of dive tourism, then it's, it's not worth anything to him. It's not changing the game. So what I think that we need to do is consider how lively, paying livelihoods to, to, to local people will help to change the game. And that's one of the elements of my research. It's whether or not um, livelihoods from dive tourism actually does make a difference in destructive fishing and overfishing. So I want to know now if you're ready to do the big reveal. 
Well, <laughs> I've been after you. <laughs> I didn't know what you were going to ask me. Come on then, out with it. <laughs> uh, could you give us some examples of sustainable um, dive businesses or doing these wonderful things that you describe in your research? So I can certainly point out what I could, what I could do is go back to a slide that I've got of, um, you know, in the scientific literature, there are lots of um, examples of negative impacts of dive tourism, and there are lots of examples of positive impacts of dive tourism. So what, what we do know, because you and I have talked before about my research, is that one of the elements of my research is to figure out what best practice dive tourism looks like. And what that we, we know is that best practice dive tourism is, the, is operators who do all of those 10 things we talked about and provide you know, the, a sort of a reasonably full spectrum of livelihoods for local people. So anyone who's doing that is a best practice dive tourism operator. So one of the things that I'm doing in my research is to look at the top four best practice dive tourism operators around the world and see what we can learn from what they're actually doing. So figure out exactly what they're doing and what we can learn from it. And then what, what I want to know, and I think other people want to know, is what elements of that can be replicated by other dive operators around the world. Because there's no point having a best practice model if, in fact, you know, nobody else can do what they're doing. But, you know, I'm pretty sure, um, knowing what I know so far, that that's not the case. But part of the research is figuring that out quite precisely. Now, you know, I, I guess in terms of a, a list of top operators, I've got a list of five, but I'm not going to tell you who they are right now because... <laughs> part of my research and, and you know I'd hate to be wrong so ask me when the results are in I have got it I'm going on my first case study uh, in the month of June there'll be another one probably in August and the rest by the end of the year so I can tell you next year. Judy you are an absolute wealth of wonderful knowledge and our industry is so lucky to have you working on this and bringing your legal mind and your bean counter mind and yeah. your and I, I love it when we we uh, hang out together because it's two geeks hanging out together and we get all excited about <laughs> talking about this stuff sustainability frameworks and <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just great because somebody has to do it. It might as well be us, and it's all going to ripple out and 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 people are going to benefit from what you are doing. This is I, I can't believe the buzz that your uh, research um, that you have not revealed yet, but your yeah. research has has already had. And I mean, it, it, there are so many people talking about it, so we can't wait. For this to come out so no excuses end of this year we want to see a paper sure but you know, you know in the meantime don't, well, don't forget that I've, I've, I actually had my survey released by the university today so the, the, two, the two elements of the um, the work that I'm doing to find you know to back up everything I've everything I've told you now comes from the literature so and naturally a little bit from my experience of diving I've dived in 18 countries around the world and I can't wait to make it 20 but, <laughs> but anyway most of it most of it comes from the literature and is backed up by anecdotal evidence, but we really need scientific evidence to, to back up and, and to answer some of the questions that arise from the knowledge that we have from the literature. So the first element is my survey that's going to go out to um, you know that 101 different countries and territories around the equator um, to dive operators asking them what they do now in terms of conservation so all those things I uh, mentioned in White's framework and then all those livelihood things that we talked about as well so I really need some help from the dive community from dive operators to um, to, to fill out my survey for me so that I'm sure they're going to get it in the mail one way or another and, um, and uh, it's online, takes 20 minutes so I'd love you to help me with that. So you're going to send me a link and we can make sure that people get that link? Absolutely. So it, it, it is password protected because it's only for dive operators. So, you know, no, nobody else gets to do it because we really want to know, you know, for what dive operators are doing now and what they're considered doing in the future. But then the second element, as we've sort of joked about, is, um, is actually going out to, um, for me, it'll be the top four operators around the world in terms of, you know, the measurements that we've spoken of and, um, and figuring out what they do and um, how they do it and whether or not what they do is replicable by other by other operators so um i'll report back when that bit's finished i can't wait for that <laughs> well you know it pays to be a phd researcher because you get to travel around the world and do all this great stuff 
It's pretty cool. But yeah, I can think of a lot of other topics. Well, you know, my, I never did a PhD in accounting. Wonder why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, what is an email that um, dive operators can uh, reach you at so that we can uh, help you? Well, my best email address is judylow at gmail.com and it's J-U-D-I-L-O-W-E at gmail.com. So everybody watching this, if you are a dive operator located in this, this area We're of... Anywhere between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. Okay, perfect. Capricorn Google Earth as to where that might be. <laughs> Contact Judy and help her with this really, really important research. Because, yeah, we, we do whatever we can to help you, Judy. This is really important Thank stuff. Thank yeah. you. And I think, you know, the, the cool thing, as I said, about this framework is that it fits in really well with a lot of the other cool work that the people you're talking to are doing. So it, it's, it just, you know, helps to bring a lot of other work together really well. So get out there. Thank you, my dear. It is now um, quarter after 10 Jakarta time. It's, it's time for you to um, shut down your computer while we ramp up for the, the noon hour here. Uh, I want to thank you so, so much for taking the time to be with us because I know you are super busy. I'm watching your travels all over the place and, and doing your research. So again, thanks for being with us. Thanks for sharing all that you've shared. And, uh, oh, uh, like your Facebook page, The Dive Tourist. Okay. Absolutely. And, yes. I, and, I, and my, one of my jobs before I leave Jakarta is to get my website up and running. It'll be this, the same name, thedivetourist.com, just to sort of talk about these issues that we've raised and talked about and give some clarity to everything. But it's a pleasure talking to you, Laurie, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. And um, I'm really looking forward to the Blue Ocean Business Summit. Can't wait. Me too. Can't <laughs> wait till we get together again and talk frameworks. Yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Take care.